Our next guest, Janet Napolitano, was the third Secretary of Homeland Security and is now the director of the University of California Berkeley Center for Security and Politics. Uh, Madam Secretary, thanks for joining us so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I asked this to former Congressman Mike Rogers. Uh, what, what is something that you think that the public needs to know about cyber that maybe it's not, you know, doesn't know now and, and big picture? Uh, what, are, what are the solutions the policymakers need to tackle? Well, I think the, the public needs to know and appreciate uh, the benefits and the risks that go along with living in a cyber um, era uh, and how it can affect their daily activities. Uh, if uh, a municipality uh, is uh, the victim of a ransomware attack and all of a sudden uh, all of its emergency services capabilities go down, its 9-11 system gets locked out, that affects uh, uh, ordinary citizens. Uh, if the grid is hacked and goes down, that affects ordinary citizens. So uh, understanding and appreciating the, the benefits of living uh, with this uh, new technology that we have, it's not new anymore, but it's constantly evolving, uh, but also the, the risks to our everyday uh, life. That's something that the public needs to kind of get embedded. One of the more vexing issues facing policymakers uh, are, are, is this whole issue of ransomware payments. Uh, you know, some say, well, listen, we can't keep paying uh, ransom, basically, uh, otherwise we're incentivizing. On the other hand, uh, these corporations, and, and I'm sure every corporate board now has been tackling, they've got to have a plan in place because maybe years ago they were asleep, uh, but now in the wake of uh, Solar winds and, and and other attacks, uh, they, they've got to kind of wake up on this. But where do you where where would you stand on on, on paying uh, the people who are attacking you? Well, it would be easy to say never pay ransom, uh, but uh, um, there are uh, real uh, demerits uh, with that kind of uh, an approach. Um, uh, and if uh, uh, you're attacked and the amount of ransom is, you know, a million or two million dollars. And in the meantime, your systems are totally down and you're locked out or you can't get access to your data or any of that kind of information. Um, you're going to weigh it. It's going to be very situational. However, uh, where I think the government needs to uh, step in is on attribution. Uh, attribution of who is the party demanding uh, ransom, uh, whether they are a state-sponsored actor, a state actor, or simply a, a state-supported actor, and then be prepared uh, at the government level to, to uh, make an appropriate response. As far as government power, just want to follow up on that. I was talking to a government official, and he was expressing frustration that you can get uh, warrants to, to go into somebody's house, break down the door if they don't answer it. Um, but, but the warrants, as far as going after uh, phone information, going after, you know, unlocking what's in their phone if it's a potential bad guy, um, it, it's a lot more difficult, especially when uh, tech companies uh, have said, well, listen, we're not, we don't want to give everything over to the government. Well, what, what's the answer there? Because then there's an incentive for cyber attackers to just uh, say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give the phone over, and, and tech companies also protecting their customers. Right. So that was the situation between the FBI and Apple a few years ago, yeah. uh, where the FBI wanted uh, uh, data from a phone uh, that had been in the possession of a shooter in San Bernardino, California, and the shooters were um, uh, had, had had some contact with terrorist organizations, and the FBI wanted that data from their phone. Uh, and Apple's response was, well, if we give it to you, then our customers will know that our promise of encryption uh, doesn't really hold. Now, in the end, another country was able to break into the, the phone, and the problem got resolved. That's a really difficult question. Um, 
How do you measure or balance uh, the customer's uh, requirement for privacy, um, et cetera, uh, versus the government's legitimate need for uh, intelligence and information? Uh, in, in my view, there ought to be uh, uh, a sort of a, uh, an elevated warrant requirement. In other words, uh, um, that the government needs to be able to demonstrate uh, not only the need for the information, but that they have no other way of getting it and that not getting it poses itself a danger to the public. Do you think there needs to be a lot more cooperation, uh, whether it's uh the, the private sector and, and, and the federal government or the federal government and, and states uh, to, you know, make sure that we, we are winning the cyber war, which, which former Congressman Mike Rogers just said, we're not winning. Uh, right. Well, I, I think one of the, the key areas that we need to improve on is the sharing of real-time information uh, between private industry that controls 85 to 90 percent of the nation's critical infrastructure uh, with the government so that uh, there is a way of knowing on a real-time basis if there's been a breach, a hack, an attack, et cetera, um, and an immediate determination made as to whether that information needs to be shared, uh, and immediate work begun on attribution for the source of the attack. Um, uh, right now, um, reporting by uh, private industry is done, you know, uh, episodically and voluntarily. And I'm not sure that that gives us the kind of coverage that we need. I want to toss it over to my colleague, uh, Maggie Miller, who is our cyber expert and a uh, great reporter. Uh, Maggie, you have a question. Hi, Madam Secretary. Thank you again so much for joining us. You bet. Um, I wanted to ask you about your position. Um, you also sit on uh, Zoom's board of directors, and I know that Zoom had one of the more difficult transitions into the current uh, COVID-19 uh, landscape in terms of so many moving online so quickly to use Zoom. Um, can you speak to some of the security improvements made, lessons learned, and also lessons learned about trying to move this type of infrastructure um, towards a, a much larger audience in a, in a faster time frame? Well, I do sit now on the Zoom board, and you're right. Um, in early spring of 2020, when everybody went into lockdown and schools went into remote learning, uh, the number of customers using the Zoom platform increased more than tenfold in like a month. I mean, it, it was an amazing transformation. And uh, the technology, fortunately, was scalable, and it was able to... Uh, um, maintain and, and uh, uh, adopt the load. Uh, but uh, because of that rapid growth, uh, the company has also been growing uh, its uh, cybersecurity and, and privacy uh, um, uh, procedures and uh, technologies that are available, end-to-end -end encryption, uh, uh, true end-to-end -end encryption, for example. Uh, and it continues to work on that and to improve it. I, uh, I wanted to touch upon education, because this is going to be a workforce issue. The cyber is going to be with us uh, for a long, long time. Uh, you've been involved in education your whole career. Uh, what do you think needs to be done on a workforce commitment? Uh, because we're going to need experts, because a lot of other countries, as you know, uh, have their own experts, and, and they don't have the highest, the best intentions. So um, uh, I read a, a recent report that uh, the government needs some 400,000 cyber competent employees to really fill uh, its uh, cyber needs. So one of the things that we're working on at UC Berkeley, where I'm now a professor, is uh, to really strengthen the workforce uh, pipeline, to really educate uh, the next uh, and diverse uh, workforce who um, have competencies in cyber, cyber technology, but also in the world of policy, policy making and the like. Um, and I think other universities need to embark on similar efforts, really dedicated to supplying the country with what it needs, which is a, a truly cyber educated workforce. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Madam Secretary. We really enjoyed the conversation. 
Thank you.